Hello. Hi, my name is Angelo Lopez, cartoonist for the Philippine News Today. And um, I'm here to interview or just have a talk with uh, David Cohn. He's, he's the political cartoonist for the Asheville Citizens Times, which is a newspaper in North Carolina. And so I want to thank you um, for being willing to do this conversation with I'm, I'm basically doing it just uh, somebody asked me why I'm doing these interviews. And it's just, you know, it's a good way for me to meet some of my cartoonist heroes or, you know, people yeah. I admire. And you're, you're one of the cart cartoonists I admire and stuff. Thank so you. you know, thank you're Angela. welcome and stuff. So, you know, um, I guess the first question that, you know, I, I think everybody asks everybody is how's these past few years been in the, during the pandemic? Um, so back in 2020, March of 2020, I turned uh, 66. So I was able to get full social security benefits. I had been working in the natural foods industry for 45 years. And so that seemed like a really good time to retire. So I retired from that business and I decided that um, I'm going to go ahead and try to draw every day. Now I've been drawing cartoons, both humorous and political since elementary school. So it's not like I wasn't doing it before then, but here was the opportunity for me to be at home every day, um, be safe every day. And um, I could draw uh, a cartoon every day, hopefully, one that was um, good because I was working for, I was already working for the newspaper. I was able to send any of my national or international cartoons up to Gannett uh, who owned the Citizen Times. And then they would distribute them to their other papers around the country. Um, so that was a really a good reason in the beginning for me to stay with the paper and, uh, get a little more exposure. I, unfortunately, I didn't get paid for any time it got to reprinted. But in the beginning, I thought, well, this would be great exposure. You know, and I don't want to say too much about Gannett, but they uh, certainly have a lot of money and it wouldn't have been a, uh, too big of a dent in their pocketbook to uh, pay all of us freelancers if one of our cartoons got uh, reprinted. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I don't know much about your area. So what are the local issues in your area that you're dealing with right now that you're during the pandemic? Well, for the most part, um, I draw about my city, Asheville, which is the largest city in Western North Carolina. It's just under a hundred thousand people. And it's pretty much in our district, which recently was represented by Madison Cawthorn, that um, we're a little blue dot in this red district. Now, North Carolina as a whole has turned pretty purple. We have a Democratic governor, but a Republican lieutenant governor. Our General Assembly is ruled by the Republicans, but some of the, uh, like Asheville, uh, the uh, Triangle area, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, they're pretty blue. So we're, we like to think of ourselves as a purple state, but in my area, when I'm drawing about Asheville, I'm drawing about the fact that we're a tourist town and that the, uh, there's an association called the Tourist Development Association. It's basically run by hoteliers and they have a tax on hotel rooms and that a large portion of that goes toward advertising Asheville as a tourist destination. Mm -hmm. So millions of dollars have gone into this campaign to bring tourists to Asheville while our infrastructure has um, suffered because of, you know, it wasn't built for 100,000 people. Um, we have cost of living. We have some of the highest um, rates of apartments in the state. Uh, and housing has just gone up the roof. People, middle class that work here, have a really hard time finding houses they can afford to buy or even to rent. And so uh, they're, they're moving further out. We get 40,000 people drive into Asheville every day for work. Wow. So a lot of people can't afford to live here, but they work here. So th those are a lot of the issues that I draw about. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't know that, actually. Yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons why I like interviewing um, uh, cartoonists like you is just, I, I, you know, you know, you, you, when you live in a certain place, you, you kind of think that everybody has the same issues as you. And then when I talk to you and stuff, um, I realized, you know, different parts of the country have different issues, right? So yeah. I, I'm a Californian, but I, I sometimes um, am hesitant to tell people I'm a Californian because people tend to get out Calif mad at Californians because, oh, a bunch of Californians moved in our state and now our, in, you know, our housing prices are rising. Are, 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 is there the similar complaint going on in, in your area? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because, you know, you might be able to sell your house for a million dollars in California and you come here and the average price on like a bungalow now is almost $400,000. Oh. And um, there's a lot of people, corporations that are buying up houses so that they can, you know, turn them into Airbnbs or they can renovate them and flip them for twice the price. Right now, if you, if you were looking for a house in Asheville, you'd have to come in with cash 10 to 20% over the asking price and you still might not get the house. Wow. Because there would be 10 other people doing the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, as a Californian, I, I apologize. <laughs> mostly, <laughs> mostly we're worried about the Floridians. Uh, we get a lot of uh, influx of Floridians up here, um, mainly because of, you know, they come up in the summer when it's terribly hot down in Florida, but it's also a lot of second homes are up here. So they come up for three or four months and um, we call them halfbacks. <laughs> <laughs> so are they full time living there or do they just go there during the summer and come back? And they come here mostly in the summer and oh, then okay. they're, they're back in Florida, you know, for whatever winter they get down there. Oh, okay. What's the weather like there? I mean, you know, is, are you guys going through that heat wave that I keep re hearing about? We just, uh, we just had like three or four days of 90 degree weather. Um, but yesterday was incredible. Uh, we had, I'm right, like maybe 20 minutes from the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is the most visited national park in the country. Oh, okay. And it's, it's like 400 miles on the crests of the, of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And so um, it's probably on a, a regular day, five to 10 degrees cooler up there. But yesterday, there was a, maybe a 35, 40 mile an hour wind. And I would say that the temperature up at um, the 6,000 foot level was, was closer to 45 or 50 degrees. It was amazing. Yeah. After those 90 degree days, it was really nice to go up there and, you know, wear, wear a jacket. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's strange, right? Because I, 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 you know, I read about Yellowstone and the floods and stuff. And I, 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 think, I think the weather's been crazy all over and stuff, so... Well, that's, you know, what I just, I just saw someone say, uh, this is the hottest summer I've ever experienced. And then the answer was, this will be the coldest summer that you ever experienced from now on. Oh, geez. Yeah. 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 It's scary and stuff, but, um, you know, but I still will visit your state and stuff and I hope to visit you, but I promise I won't move there. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Come on down. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I, I'm curious. Um, you, okay, you've been a cartoonist now for the Asheville Citizen Times for I think 15 years. Is that right? I'm in my 17th year. Or 17th. Okay. Um, what's it been like? I mean, um, cartooning there. You know, and I guess how did you become a cartoonist? Uh, when I was when I was a little kid, my dad's parents lived in England. Um, and they would send us uh, cartoon books of this one cartoonist in London, uh, Carl Giles. Oh. And I, I still have those books. And they are um, incredibly detailed and incredibly down to earth um, when it comes to this. He draws about this family, um, like three or four generations of this family all living together and what goes on for them in their daily lives. And I was so inspired by that. I just, I mean, I, I, I already liked drawing, but when I saw those cartoons, I was really inspired to start trying to draw cartoons. So this was fourth or fifth grade. 
And, um, you know, I drew in high school and uh, in college. And um, I, it was something I could do, you know, so it was something that um, I concentrated on. I wasn't, uh, it was, it came naturally to me. So it wasn't something that I had to really work hard at. I think because if you look at me, basically, I'm a lazy person. And that uh, <laughs> I don't do a lot of backgrounds in my cartoons. Um, so, uh, oh, I can do I am this. Not, I am not giving the critique on lazy people. I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty lazy myself at times. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for the paper, you know, um, I, I've lived here in, in Asheville since 1970. So I've been drawing cartoons here for other publications. There's a, an alternative weekly that I worked for for 10 years. And I just decided that I'm going to try to get in the citizen and because that's kind of always been a dream to be the editorial cartoonist for my daily paper. Um, I think I was born a little too late because uh, by the time I got to that stage, you know, we were already starting to be phased out, um, you know, when it comes to uh, editorial cartooning in papers, you know, the internet was starting up and, um, Papers got a lot slimmer because they lost all their advertisers because they could advertise on the internet. Yeah. So it was really, um, yeah, I probably 10, 20 years too late, but I've, I've been in the paper for almost 17 years. And uh, when I went up there, I had some samples and uh, our, the main editor was a guy who had come here from South Africa and he's been, He's been an editor for a number of different papers uh, around the country. He's been very busy in that field, Jeffrey Green. And he and uh, the chief editor, uh, Susan Yenny, they looked at the stuff and they said, well, we really like this and we think you could do this. Uh, what kind of deal can you give us? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay. Again, I was really happy to get in. So I started off at $35 a cartoon. Uh -huh. And um, it was one a week. And then I said, well, you know, things move so fast. If I had two a week, I could comment on things that were, you know, a little more current. Uh, as it is, the newspaper's, you know, a day or so behind anyway yeah. uh, with, with the news. So uh, they said, OK. And so it's been it, it took another maybe 10 years before I got a raise. And uh -huh. then. Um, just now, when the paper decided that they were going to go back to two days a week, they gave me another raise. So uh, that's good. Uh, and um, I have gone through probably three or four editors, a couple of different publishers in this time. Uh, people have started there and then moved on up, up the ladder. Um, so, you know, I feel fortunate that I'm able to still do this for them. Uh, it's part of my uh, income stream. Um, yeah. And so uh, I have a regular client in California and a regular one here in another town in, in North Carolina. So when I turn 66, Social Security allows me to make as much money as I can anywhere else. So yeah. I'm not only getting my Social Security, I'm getting these other incomes, plus uh, any music gigs that I get. So, you know, I'm, I'm fairly comfortable. I don't imagine that I'll uh, end up in the poorhouse, but uh, it's, it's tight, you know, tight like it is for everyone else. Yeah. So you won't be hiring a chauffeur anytime soon. <laughs> oh, or an anchor. <laughs> so, it'll just be me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I'm curious. You know, you, you talked about you, how you were able to negotiate with your editors. Do you have a friendly relationship with your editors? Does that help you? Because, you know, I, I, I've only seen my uh, editor once when I, I think uh, when I was trying out for to do editorial cartoons for the Philippine News Today. And, yeah. you know, to be honest, I don't remember what my editors look like because I, I, only, I only email them, my, my cartoons. And so I, I don't really interact with them except for that and stuff. Like when you're negotiating, um, you, you know, your, um, how much you get paid or, you know, just, you know, do you interact with your editors or no? Um, well, before the pandemic, I would go to editorial board meetings and I would sit at a big round table with 
the editor of the publisher, uh, a number of uh, reporters, the editorial page editor, um, and we would, I would just take notes on what they were planning on drawing, on writing about that week. Oh. Um, you know, and since the pandemic, um, no one was in the office. And even now, for the most part, they're all still working from home. So mm -hmm. there's no more, no more board meetings. But like you, I email in my cartoons and basically all of the negotiations was done over email. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I still haven't, I still haven't met the current publisher. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like me. I, you know, I have a, you know, there's a, you know, in the newspaper, there's an, a picture of the editor, but it's, I think the picture is probably 20 years old. So I'm guessing that the editor doesn't look like that now and stuff. So, <laughs> so I'm always wondering, gosh, you know, I'm emailing these people, but I wonder what they look like, <laughs> you know, but you know, you've, you've been doing your paper for, you know, this stuff for a while now. Um, I, when I first met you, on, you're one of the first cartoonists I met on Facebook, right? And you were the one, I think, who introduced me to uh, Carl Giles, right? And I think David Lowe and um, Arthur Zick, right? Yeah, it's pronounced Schick. Schick, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I really appreciate that. I, if it wasn't for you, I would have never have known these cartoonists. And I, I now they, they've had an influence in my life. It's, how, how did you, I know with Carl Giles and stuff, you were introduced to him from your relatives in England. How, how did yeah. you know about these other cartoonists? Um, I guess over the years, whenever I see a cartoon book, you know, in the bookstore or a used books or something, um, but also, you know, being a member of the AAEC, I kind of uh, will look up some of the other guys' work. Um, and in my Facebook and Instagram feed, I, I have a lot of cartoonist friends, so I get to see their work that way. Um, it's, it can almost be random. I hear about somebody like with David Lowe. I heard about him, and I was talking about it with uh, my wife at the time. And for my birthday, she bought me a, a book that she found somewhere online of David Lowe's cartoons from the 40s and 50s. And uh, yeah, he's like, great, right? Oh my God. <laughs> and, uh, and he's, he's one of the guys that I have taken in as an influence on how I draw. Okay. Um, you know, back before color was cheap to print, everybody drew in black and white. And um, they would either shade with cross hatching or they would use uh, zip a tone, yeah. uh, press on, or they would um, use like, like a, I think it was like a Conti crayon or something for, uh, for large areas of shading. Um, and I started off doing just the ink, ink lines, but then I, you know, I thought, well, I can use uh, a black Prismacolor pencil to get the same effect that I, that these guys were doing with the, the Conti crayons. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you look at most editorial cartoons and you'll see in the space around the main thing, there's, there's some shading going on, which not only defines kind of a background, but it also focuses your eye on the main thing you want people to focus on. And so if I was really like hundred percent lazier, I wouldn't even do that. I would just have <laughs> these figures right there in the blank piece of paper, but I like to frame them with, with these, uh, uh, you know, this shaded areas, you know, some of the cartoons I sent to you, you can see that uh, how, that's how I, I sort of imply a background. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I, I have to thank you because in my, a lot of the technique I have now, it's from looking at the cartoon as you recommended to me. And so the oh. Conti crayon, the, the the brush line, all yeah. of that stuff is influenced by those. those I, I, mean, I think both of us are sort of comic nerds and stuff. We just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we get into a cartoonist. We try to look up everything in a cartoonist, you know, and, um, you know, like I, I have devoured the, the, the library. And, uh, you, you were talking about old bookstores. Is, are there still a lot of old bookstores in your area? 
there's a there's one really big one called Mr. K's, and I think it's it might be a uh, franchise, but I know there was one in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they came over here and opened one here. Um, there's also a place right downtown uh, called Downtown Books and News, which is a sister store to one of the best independent bookstores in the country is right here in our city. Um, so yeah, there's even a possibility that I could find one of my books, which I, I have one book, which I printed in 87 oh. and uh, I only have a couple of copies left and I'd like to, you know, I search the, uh, these used bookstores every now and then just to see if someone, you know, wanted to get rid of theirs. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have it on hand right now or? Uh, let's see. I don't, I don't see it at the moment. Um, okay. Why don't you just tell us the time so that if, you know, somebody who's viewing this video happens to be in an old bookstore, maybe they can look up your, your well, book. Basically it was just a, it was the name of my strip called Coincidence, C-O-H-E-N-C-I-D-E-N-T-S. Oh, okay. -E -E let me see. Can you see this? Yeah, I see it. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of what the title was. Oh, cool, cool. When was it published? Uh, who? Where? Oh, when? When was it published? When? Oh, it was 1987. Okay, okay. So, well, I'll you know, go look I, in the bookstore and I'll look for it. I've had, I mean, I actually had an ISBN number on it, so it, it's listed somewhere. But um, I've had any number of people say, oh, you should do another book. And, you know, little lazy me says, yeah, sure, I'll get around to that someday. Uh, but right now, um, the biggest step I've taken is I contacted the university here and they have a... Um, What's the term? They have a, a place where they keep uh, a lot of media that has been pertinent to this, this region of the country. And so I, I suggested to them, would you be willing to take my cartoons? Because I've, I've probably got about 5,000, 6,000 cartoons that okay. I've been drawing since I've lived here. And they said, absolutely. Uh, so I'm in the, in so the process cool. of cataloging what I have, you know, and um, I just, I got to the point where I was like, what's going to happen to this stuff when I die? Yeah. And so I wanted to, I wanted to have it somewhere where they're going to catalog it. it. You'll be able to go in and say, Hey, let me see one of David's cartoons that has to do with um, the pollution in the river. And they'll be able to, you know, pull it up and uh, say, and pull it out. And they, they're doing, you know, preserving them they're going to be you know each one's going to be wrapped up so it's it's uh it's almost taking the place of me doing another book <laughs> <laughs> well you could still do another book anyway i i do books I but i i self publish it through kindle Pre kindle uh, they have a kindle publishing thing and stuff so i have yeah. a couple of your books Oh, you, oh, okay. Thank you. So you're the one who's, <laughs> I don't, my sales are not that big. So <laughs> I think it's in the two digits and stuff. So yeah, not many people know my stuff. I'm guessing you have a bigger readership than I do, right? you know, because you're in more, um, uh, I guess because you're in a Gannett uh, publishing and stuff, I'm assuming you have a wider readership. Well, so I have, um, I, I put my cartoons up on all different social media, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram on, on, I have a separate Instagram, a separate Facebook page for just new cartoons. And there are about 2,500 people that follow that are, that like that page. Um, and that's in like 40 different countries around the world. So uh, it's really cool. Every now and then I'll see someone like a cartoon and I'll go look at their name and I'll say, Oh, this person's in Germany or this person is in Brazil. <laughs> Um, hopefully they'll speak English so they can understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> you know, I look at your cartoons and even though it's local and stuff, a lot of them, you know, they're very pertinent and stuff. So, you know, you, you, you know I'm, I'm, I'm a Californian and stuff, so I still yeah, understand but, your cartoons. So, you know, I wanted to say one thing to you, Angelo, is that, you know, back when, um, you remember Jeff McNally? 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so when he burst on the scene, he actually went to the University of North Carolina and he started drawing for the Daily Tar Heel. That's where mm-hmm. he, he got his start. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he, he came on the scene and his style was like the essence of everything beforehand that he just, he was able to, he was so good and he was so good at what he did that he kind of became the, this, okay, everybody else, you got to come up to this level. Yeah. And you got to, you got to kind of draw like that too. And so yeah. his style became the de facto style that editorial cartoonists had to follow. And a lot of, a lot of them still do. But one of the things that I've learned from the, uh, being a member of the AAEC and looking at your work and my work is like, you know, there's room for all different kinds of styles of editorial yeah. cartooning. And, you know, I think you and I, we benefit from the fact that we don't look like anybody else's work. Yeah. And that, you know, people go, oh, yeah, I can see that. That's an Angelo Lopez cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. For better or for worse. Yeah, that's mine. Yeah. For better or for worse. And for me, my influences, you know, I I, I think I'm considerably older than you. Um, My influences go back to, uh, you know, Herb Block and Paul Conrad and uh, Hugh Haney, these guys that were just doing it all in black and white with broad strokes. You know, I'm still not that comfortable with a brush, but um, every now and then I'll, I'll try, I'll try again using a brush or a brush pen yeah. to get those, that effect. So you know, people are saying, well, editorial cartooning is, is dead. It's gone. You know, papers are dying. So there's no hardly any more staff cartoonists anymore. But I think there's more people drawing than ever before. Yeah, and it is so diverse. The Internet is, you know, how we're getting out there now. Most of us haven't figured out how to capitalize on that yet. Yeah. But um, that's that's where it's going. So. You know, we, we got to figure that out if we want to continue to do this and, you know, make some kind of living at it. Yeah, I think that's true with most artists stuff is that, you know, we, we love to draw, we love to paint, we, you know, we love to do all the stuff, but we, we you know, we, we struggle more with marketing. Yeah. You know, we struggle with like the business end of it and stuff like with me, I, I'm in the, the Philippine. <laughs> yeah and with me I, I love to draw and i love to um, but you know how finding another paper you know all of that you know syndication how to monetize my work you know i i, I really don't know and stuff and it's not really something it, it's i think it's something you have to do if you want to be a cartoonist but it's not something i really enjoy and stuff right you know who's really good at that is clay jones oh okay he's a still- self-syndicated and he sends out packages all the time uh, and i think the, the majority of the people he sends to use his work you know he gets some kickback from uh, some people that are you know right wing and uh but for the most part you know he, he's able to access that side of his brain to be able to do that part of it and i'm like you it's like oh they'll they'll find me you know uh because I'm, I'm so great and they'll find me and, you know, I'm out there and, you know, everyone will know who I am. It's like, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I notice in some cartoonists, um, I look in their Facebook and they have like 50 likes on their cartoon. And when, you know, when I look at mine, I have like one or two. <laughs> and I, I think you, 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 that's why I'm wondering with you and stuff. I mean, you have a bigger readership and stuff. Do you still feel like, um, um, you know, you were talking about some of the cartoonists that you, you were influenced by, Herblock, Conrad, um, I forgot the name of the other cartoonist. Um, Hugh, Hugh Haney? Yeah, I, I, yeah you, you may have to let me know about him a little later, because I, I, he's one cartoonist I'm not familiar with. But, you know, remember you, you introduced me to David Lowe, Carl Giles. They, 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 had, um, they had national influence, right? But... You know, I, I talked about this with another cartoonist. Do you think we're having more, our, our influence is not as much national anymore. You, it, you know, it's more local, right? So 
Do you well, agree with that, or you're not syndicated? I'm assuming. No, no. And I'm not syndicated. So, yeah. you know, the only way my work gets out there is if you can net. They'll put it up. They have a gallery on USA Today, and all the freelancers send them stuff, and it goes up there. But they also send out to all the editors of their papers. Say, here's here's you know this week's cartoons. You if you want to use them, they're they're there for you to use. And the only way I know if someone picks one of those up is uh, if I have a friend who lives in that city. They'll say, oh, David, I saw one of your cartoons in our paper. Um, yeah. So it's hard to say, you know, not being syndicated, um, it's hard to say what kind of national reach I have. Uh, huh. Now, your, your stuff. It's in supermarkets stuff, in the Bay Area. The, the readership is around 25,000. Your stuff is very specific. Yeah. You know, it's very specific topics about, you know, Filipino stuff. Uh, What's going on in the Philippines? Um, you know, in your books, you know, I, there was other topics, but most of the stuff that I see on the internet is definitely geared toward Philippines, uh, the yeah. Philippines. So, you know, it, it might be that uh, if you drew more things that were more, you know, relatable to people in other parts of the country or the world, your readership would expand, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. Just because... Yeah. Uh, or people would, would understand what, what it was you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I have is I, I do a lot of research and stuff, but one of the drawbacks to that is that, you, you know, you can sometimes learn no too much. So I do cartoons based on my research, but you know, most of my readers don't do the research that I do. And so one of the, um, one of the uh, things I have to be careful of is to make sure my readers actually know what my cartoons are talking about. <laughs> You know, whereas with yours, one of the things I like about your cartoons is even if I don't live in Asheville, I, I basically know what your cartoons are talking about. You know, you know, there's a um, you're very you're a very good communicator. I had to um, I had to learn that because um, in some ways there was when I was younger, I thought that I um, I was so hip that I could pull I could draw something that I laughed my ass off about but no one else got it. and I had to explain it. And so I figured out, okay, well, I can't do that and expect to sell cartoons. So in some ways I have worked at trying to make it as accessible as possible. You know, the caption, you know, there's a lot of cartoonists these days um, like uh, Matt Boers or Tom Tomorrow. These guys, I love their work, but it's not anything that I would do because um my whole thing is reducing the idea and the amount of words in the cartoon to the bare minimum to uh -huh. get my point across. Yeah. And, um, you know, in some ways I feel like those guys are really uh, having to do all that to get their point across. Yeah. Yeah. So, I wonder about that because um, both you and I do single panel for the most part, whereas they have multi-panel. And I, I won't, I have, I've asked a few cartoonists about this, is I'm wondering if in multi-panel cartoons, you can have nuance, whereas single panels, we have to get the message quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, with a multi-panel cartoon, there is room for uh, nuance. There's, there's, you know, you can, one panel to the next, it's like a, a conversation over uh, over a couple of days you know it's yeah. like but you're right uh you know a single panel has you have one one shot if they don't get it is you know turn the page uh, yeah. now besides putting the captions to a bare minimum or the dialogue i also like to include little details every now and then that you have to look for you know, not like uh, not like Hirschfeld putting his daughter's name in it, but sometimes oh, Nina, just right. Is it Nina? Yeah, yeah <laughs> just something that would be uh, you know. Oh, look! Uh, in that belt buckle, there's an initial. What is that for? Or um, you know, what's going on over there? I rarely use anybody' idea that they give me, but if I do use it, I will hide 
their name or their initials somewhere in the cartoon. Uh-huh. Uh, just sort of as like a, an homage to them. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm a big Hirschfeld. Did you see his documentary? Yes. Yeah, yes. that was good. And yeah, he was I've doing- got a book of his too that's just, uh, it's phenomenal what he can do with the line. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned a few people who are, who are your influences. Um, do you have what? Who do you have any more and stuff? Like you know, you met you 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 recommended to me Carl Giles and David Lowe, yeah. and you mentioned Herb Block and Conrad and Oliphant. You know, he's uh, he's the giant in the field. Uh, uh-huh. He's uh, <laughs> is he still know, alive? Or he is still alive. Someone just posted that Adam Ziegler. He just posted that he uh, got a picture of him with uh, with Oliphant. Oh, okay. So that was uh, that was cool. You know, I don't think he's drawing very much anymore. Yeah, um, I haven't seen his stuff lately, so that, that's all I was yeah. asking. Steve Sack um, is a great cartoonist. He just retired. Oh. Um, he had some uh, surgery on his drawing hand that he had to. Oh, Corporal you know, Tunnel, right? Was it Corporal Tunnel? Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, at our age, it just it takes longer to heal. So he's decided, you know, after 40-something years at the, at the Minneapolis paper, he was going to retire. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I briefly met him. He's, again, I only talked to him for like a minute, but he was a very nice guy and stuff. So. Yeah, I bet. He's, yeah. We've exchanged some, uh, some emails, and he's, <coughs> he's a... Um, He's very encouraging about my work, which is like, you know, oh, God, he's <laughs> <laughs> <That's> my work. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. Whenever I meet a cartoonist, I admired stuff. You know, there's always that, um, you know, foot and mouth thing that I worry about, you know, or like <laughs> that uh, deer in the headlights thing. Yeah, I, I think I probably made a fool out of myself a few times trying to meet a few cartoonists at the conventions and stuff. So. <laughs> So I'm always are thinking, you, like, I try to bring my wife so that if I do anything too stupid, she could smack me in the head. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, are you thinking about going to the convention this year? I was I, At first, I was going to go. Um, it depends and stuff. I, I'm not as sure as I was, like, two months ago. But I do want to go because I've never been to the Billy Ireland Museum. Yeah, okay. and I would love to go to that and stuff. So. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm 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 in the same way, you know. I was thinking I could drive there and save oh, okay. save some money that way, you know. And then, um, you know, it's it's not cheap. You know, it, it costs money to go to the convention. Then you have to get there, and then the hotel room and all. But <laughs> after a couple of years of no conventions, uh, you know, it's nice that this one is at least this close to me. It's so much nicer to talk to someone face to face, especially mm-hmm. someone that you admire, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, so, yeah, I'm hoping to go, but I'm not sure yet and stuff. But cross your fingers and stuff. It's just yeah. um, th- there's been a lot of health problems in my, my, my family lately and stuff that I've had to take care of. So, okay, yeah. You know, I'm curious. Um, you know, you're a liberal cartoonist in a red state, right? Um, I, I, how's that been? I mean, um, you know, um, I, I know with me, even though I'm in California, I'm, I'm a liberal, but I, I, have, I, used, I used to have a lot of conservative friends. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and the past 20 years, I've gone through this painful process of losing people who were once close friends, you know, because things changed and stuff, right? Um, how's it been for you? I mean, I mean, both in your political, just in your cartoons and just socially and stuff, have you lost any conservative friends? Has it been... Uh, no, not really. You know, um, like I was saying earlier, uh, North Carolina has become like a purple state. But yeah. District uh, 11, which is w- my district, which includes like 17 counties in western North Carolina, Asheville is this little blue bubble, and the rest of it is pretty red. So, um, and Madison Cawthorn was our representative uh, just until this last election. Uh, uh, there'll be, he lost in the primary, so he won't be coming back for the general election. Um, to, but just the fact that he got elected, yeah. uh, you know, in some ways, over the time that I've been with the paper, there have been very few letters to the paper, to the editor saying anything about my cartoons. Um, so, it's hard to gauge, 
what my impact is uh, when it comes to my positions and what the majority of the population of my district might think. <clears throat> because I, I mostly draw about Asheville and just the immediate area, which so I have, I don't have a whole lot of conservative minded friends mm -hmm. socially. So I'm kind of living in a little bubble myself. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> most of my friends agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, like with me, I, I'm starting to get into a little liberal bubble, but some of it is just that, you know, um, it's not, it's not by design. You know, it's just that some of, you know, uh, as, as the partisan times got more, uh, as the times got more partisan, I, I just lost the conservative friends. So by default, my friends became more liberal or, you know, either moderate or liberal. So it was, it was not, it was not an intentional thing. Right. So. I think, uh, I think uh, in the last, uh, last 10 years, you know, sort of the rise of Trump and that ultra conservative evangelical right wing movement moving into the government sphere. I think, you know, that's really accelerated all of the division that we now see in the country between, you know, blue and red, uh, liberal and conservative. Um, you know, there's, it's, it, it's easy to generalize and there's a lot of people that are like live and let live. You know, I don't agree with you, but uh, I, you know, it's fine that you have those opinions. I have my opinions. Um, so in some ways the media really tends to uh, focus and enlarge that divide, uh, you know, um, and, if, I'm sure you're aware there's, you know, the number of liberal cartoonists versus the number of conservative cartoonists. It's way unbalanced. <laughs> Many more liberal cartoonists than there are conservative cartoonists. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and a liberal cartoonist generally will attack anybody. If you're doing something stupid, you know, then they'll, we'll comment on it. Um, conservative cartoonists, that's not generally the way that they work, in, in my opinion, my understanding. It's like, you know, they're not going to, though recently, I mean, people like Ramirez, I saw that he, you know, he was giving Trump a hard time. Uh, you know, the, the whole January 6th committee hearings are are so fascinating to watch. You get to see right there these people, a lot of them Republicans. You know, it's coming right out and saying, you know, yeah, he knew uh, everybody lied. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is treason. Um, it's it's like right in our faces. Um, whereas before, it was kind of like, oh, you know, they were just tourists looking <laughs> looking to take yeah. a you know a trip around the, uh, the rotunda. You, you know, or, you've done a lot uh, of good cartoons on that and stuff. You know, oh, where yeah. you really point out that kind of thing. I, I sometimes think of it as hypocrisy, but I sometimes think it's groupthink, where you you just get scared of it, telling how you actually feel, right? Mm. You know. Yeah. Well, and you look at a lot of the uh, Republican politicians; they're they're totally scared yeah. of not having of his endorsement, uh, yeah. even though in private they might tell you, you know, oh yeah, he, uh, I don't. I don't trust him. I don't, you know, I don't, the fact that he's cheated on all his wives, uh, the fact that he, you know, wants to grab women, you know, by the pussy, uh, all of that stuff. You normally would think, why, why are these people supporting this guy? Yeah. And for me, why are white evangelicals supporting this guy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and that just to me points out the hypocrisy that they're living in. Yeah. Evangelicals, you know, it, it's about power. Oh well, you know, we'll overlook that stuff because we get to be in power with him. Yeah, <sighs> because, because you're, you know, you, you know, that was one of the questions I was going to ask. Because 
you know, Madison Cawthorn was one of your rep. Do you have any insights and in, like his supporters and stuff? I mean, no, you don't have to worry about him anymore, but you were right in saying, I bet he got elected and stuff. He did. Being he got so elected weird. over, over oh. a guy who was like a, a, a prosecutor at Guantanamo, had, had retired from the military, uh, a brilliant guy. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Morris Davis. Uh, a retired colonel, uh, a lawyer, had spent time working in D.C. and in uh, at Guantanamo. Um, the fact that, well, like I said, you know, most of my district is red. So if you had an R behind your name, it wouldn't matter, you know, if you were a serial killer. Uh, uh, I'm laughing, gonna, but I shouldn't be laughing. <laughs> no, no, it's like it's 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 it's, it's pitiful. Um, he was in a wheelchair. Uh, he's extremely handsome and photogenic. Um, he says what the people in those red counties wanted to hear. And he was endorsed by Trump. So he had, from the outset, he said he wasn't concerned about legislation. He was mostly concerned about communication. Uh -huh. So he would spend a lot of time Tweetings, you know, just like his mentor, saying things that were uh, right wing bullet points. Um, but then again, he was caught carrying weapons into schools. Oh. He uh, he was arrested twice for uh, driving with an ex without a license and speeding. Um, he. I don't know if you saw the pictures. Uh, he was on a cruise and they were playing a game where he wound up, there were pictures of him dressed in women's clothes. <coughs> and he had like this really drunk expression on his face. Yeah. Um, his marriage, uh, you know, the right wing sanctity of marriage. Uh, he married some uh, aerobics instructor uh, and got divorced after six months. Uh, so, you know, when it comes to family values, I mean, he was homeschooled. He had one semester in college uh, and all of the uh, very small Christian college. He flunked out uh, after one semester and 150 people at that college signed a letter saying that he was a sexual predator and don't be alone with him in a car. Wow. wow. So all of this stuff, you know, it had all of us here in Asheville scratching our heads, like, how could this guy get elected? And then throughout his term, he, as a freshman representative, he was number one in the number of missed votes. He was, he was traveling, not even in his district. He was traveling around the country, yeah. speaking, endorsing other candidates. So, you know, he wasn't in, in, by any means, shape or form, representing the people of uh, NC-11. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have some good people running. Uh, there's a Republican running who personally I've met, and he's a little more dangerous than Cawthorn because he actually knows how the system works and he can get sh shit done. Um, but, you know, there's, uh, there's some good... Democrats running against him. So we'll have to see how it turns out. I'm curious, um, because you had this view coming from a red state that do you think this, do you think the Republican Party can ever be pulled back from that edge? Do you, do you think the partisan divide can be bridged? Or is that, you know, I, don't, I, I come from California, so I don't have a good view on that. Um. It, have you been watching the, uh, the January 6th meetings? The first two days. I haven't okay. seen day three or four yet. You saw Liz Cheney say, one day Trump will be gone, but your legacy will live on. Yeah. And I think that's true. Um, you know, in many ways, Americans have short memory. And um, once Trump is gone, some of this will probably die down. Yeah. But I think that, uh, he opened a crack 
and that crack is not going to seal up again. You know, it takes a lot to get Americans to change their minds about things. You know, I always thought that uh, back when nuclear power was a big issue, I always thought, well, it's going to take something like a meltdown and half of a state is uninhabitable before Americans go, oh, well, we got to do something else. Yeah. Um, yeah. And right now, with the climate, you know, the storms that are happening, uh, the way th drought, all this going on, it might be too late, but it's also just that much more in the front of people's minds. And people are a little more open to the idea of solar, wind, uh, hydroelectric, uh, each house, individual house having its own power supply, you know, getting off the grid, because all that stuff is also vulnerable to hackers, uh, which has happened already. So it's, um, I don't think, I think it would take a huge calamity to unite Americans again, you know, kind of like September 11th did um, yeah. for a short period of time. Um, yeah. Did I you just see that hope movie that, uh, about the meteor crashing onto Earth with Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, I haven't seen it, but I I, wrote, I know about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it would have to hit. It would be like, all the buildup would be like, oh no, I don't believe it. You know, it would have to hit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Philippines, we have a similar thing. I haven't been, in, in the, I, my, you know, you were saying how my cartoons are really uh, hyper-focused on uh, the Philippines, and it's because I'm scared to death of Duterte. And now, did you, did you read recently, uh, Ferdinand Marcos' son just recently got elected president of the Philippines. Yeah. And I think both of those things terrify me. And a lot of the same dynamics you're talking about is happening in the Philippines, you know, yeah. them forgetting history. The revision of history, the um, you know, um, you know, uh, in spite of twenty-seven thousand extrajudicial killings, um, uh, Duterte's popularity is in the high seventies, right? Yeah. And stuff. So um, you know, and now Marcos is um, is coming to power, and the Marcos families had a disinformation campaign on social media. Because um, a lot of a younger generation of Filipinos never didn't learn about how bad the martial law period was. And so they're trying to make it out to be a golden age when it was actually a terrible time. Both they, they tanked the economy. They had all these human rights violations. So you know, the, the dynamic you're talking about in America, it's, it's happening in the Philippines. And I'm guessing in a lot of places around the world. And stuff so yeah 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 so you know i know a little bit about madison cochran but i didn't know all the detail you said so thank you for letting me know about that yeah he's uh he's, he's the worst example of uh of the blindness of a lot of republican voters you know it's like it doesn't matter who he is or what he's done i mean look at trump uh you know You've seen the pictures of him making fun of that disabled reporter. And it's like, at what point in, in this country did that not say immediately go, get that guy out of here? You know, it's like 50 years ago, uh, he would have been run out of office. Yeah. Yeah. It's just amazing, you know, what people can get by with today. And I, I have to say, a lot of that has to do with social media because you can anonymously let your hate and rage out now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I used to, I, I still have some conservative friends and uh, some of my, a lot of, the, but a lot of those friends are anti-Trump conservatives. I used to think that I used to have this hope that maybe anti-Trump conservatives can fight back and win back the party. That, that hope is, um, a lot less now, <laughs> but I, I admire them and stuff. But you know, I'm, I'm sure you know. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking as a liberal, but I'm sure an anti-Trump conservatives are probably you know, feeling miserable right now and stuff. You know, but right, so, they're, they're staying underground. Yeah, <laughs> in the few that they want, to get, they want to get reelected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but okay, on to a less depressing subject. I guess <laughs> I, I want to talk about craft. And stuff. I love your cartoons. You know the softness of your cartoons. Can you tell me a little bit about how you do your cartoons? 
like you know do you do pen do you still do you go on the computer or um yeah i am um, i i I use Bristol board, a uh, okay. hundred pound Bristol board, smooth. And I, um, I use an HB pencil okay. to sketch out my idea. And then I um, generally will ink it. Uh, I use, um, let's see. This is a, a Faber Castell pit artist pen oh wow wow different okay. uh they have different um sizes some of them like extra small small fine medium brush uh so i use those and then i use a prismacolor uh, black colored pencil to do my shading okay and um then i scan them into the computer and i'll go i have a I'm on uh, Mac, so I go to preview, and I'll, I'll generally darken it a little bit in preview, um, and then uh, resize it. Um, I generally like to keep my cartoons somewhere between one and two uh, megabytes okay. size-wise, and then uh, that's it. You know, that's that's it. You know, now if I'm doing a um, a pet portrait, which I also do. And I'm doing some illustrations for a magazine uh, here in North Carolina. Um, generally what I'll do is once I've penciled the idea, I'll take a picture of it with my iPhone because my scanner doesn't really pick up pencil that well. Oh, okay. And I'll send that to the client and then they can say, oh, okay, uh, change this, change that. Or you can go ahead and ink that for me. Um, uh, and, uh, I'm not, I, I don't have much of a color sense, like what goes with what and what works really well. I do some of this things for this magazine, they want the illustrations in color. So I generally do watercolors, watercolors uh -huh. and a little bit of colored pencils, um, but that's not my forte. Uh, and for the most part, I can barely please myself when I do something <laughs> in color. <laughs> So I, I does does your ink black. run? I mean, because you say you're doing watercolor. So that that ink that you that pen you use, it's waterproof ink. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was, one of the problems I had sometimes I accidentally buy non-waterproof India ink, and I yeah. think, ah, why did I do that? <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Got to start over. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, yeah. one of the things that I, I, I love about your stuff, because I, I, you, you do these cartoons where everything is, is uh, black and white or gray, and then you have this spot of red and stuff. I love that effect because this, the red really pops out and stuff. How did you get, think of that idea? I, I think I saw it as other cartoonists work. You know, they might, well, the red hat, the uh, Make America Great Again and, and Trump's red tie, you know, yeah. you can't really portray those in black and white. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So uh, I can get a really deep red with a, a Prismacolor red pencil, and um, oh, okay, okay. You're you're right. It really it really stands out, and it, it just jumps jumps out at you. So I, uh, that's about the extent of my color sense. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, I see. But you know, you don't really need that much of a. You know, I, I think as long as you 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 know you find what you're comfortable with and you work within those me those means and stuff, that's exactly. fine and stuff. And you know, I think you're the as far as I know, you're the only one who um, who does that and stuff. And I think it's a wonderful technique. I was assuming it was just that uh, your paper only does three color print or something, <laughs> but it, it's something you consciously do. In um. In the 17 years that I've worked for my paper, uh -huh. they have never printed one of my cartoons that had color in it. Yeah. In color. They occasionally, and again, so much of this stuff is done in a central hub. You know, Gannett does a lot of layout and all that shit. So they <clears throat> occasionally there will be a color cartoon on the editorial page. But when I talk to my paper about it, they say, oh, we didn't do that. You know, that's, that's not our choice. That's something that they do up in Cincinnati or Louisville. So um, I, 
I generally, you know, even when I've done a full color cartoon, they'll print it in black and white. Oh, okay. You know, one of the big things around here is uh, in the fall, the color of the leaves uh, is just brilliant, you know, coloring, you know, red, yellow, uh, orange. It's just incredibly beautiful. But if they don't print those cartoons in color, then it's like it's lost. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I, I, don't draw, I don't draw about that too much. Yeah, somebody asked me why I do black and white. And I think I just always assumed that the editor only wants uh, black and white, but I've never actually asked and stuff. So I'm, I'm trying to get the courage to one of these days say, would, it, would you mind if I did a color cartoon and would you publish in color? So, you know. Do they, do they publish uh, color photographs? Um, I think they do in the front cover and, you know, the front page and stuff. So yeah. maybe they will. It's just, you know, when they asked me, I, I've been doing the paper since 2011 and all those years, I, I, it never occurred to me to ask. Right. <laughs> you know, well, so, you know it, it, that's a fairly new thing, you know? So it's like, if you grew up like we did uh, at a time when they only could print black and white, uh, then that's kind of our mindset. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't mind. It would just take longer and stuff to do. And, you know, you know, like I love like Matt Worker's work and stuff. And I think yeah. he does it by hand, right? He doesn't go yeah, by the I, I, yeah. I saw a photo of him working and it's all hand watercolor. And he draws, I mean, like on a big, his cartoons are really big. Oh, no, I never seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. My stuff is always um, nine by 12 and stuff or um, eight and a half by 11 because um. um um, you know, it shrinks down and stuff, but um, I'm thinking speed and stuff. You know, I, I was going to ask you about your, what's your schedule when you do your cartoons? You know, for me, Monday, Tuesday, I start reading and researching. Wednesday, Thursday, I draw and then ink my cartoons. I try to finish by Friday so that in the weekends I have time to spend with my wife and stuff. What's your schedule? Um, so... For most of the time I've been with the paper, it was in Wednesdays and Sundays were the days that my cartoons were in. So for a Wednesday cartoon, I would draw over the weekend, Saturday or Sunday. Okay. For the, for the next Sunday cartoon, I would draw on Wednesday. Oh. Um, but now I draw every day. Um, and I draw, I still kind of follow those that schedule for the newspaper, but I'm drawing every day for um, <clears throat> social media, um, this uh, online magazine out in California that I work for. They have a lot of um, evergreen articles that they want cartoons for, and they come up with a new article every week. So there's a lot of back and forth between me and them. Uh, I send them pencils and then they say, oh, do this, do that. It's interesting. They're the only client I have that basically tells me what to draw. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, sometimes it, it's a little frustrating, uh -huh. but they pay me so well <laughs> <laughs> that I'm okay with it for now, at least for now. You know, oh, okay. it's like they're, they're great people and they like my work. Um, and it didn't take them very long to give me a raise. So I'm happy about that. And, uh, you know, they, they disseminate the work through not only through their online site, but through social media as well. Um, I don't generally post those because they're, they're really tied to the articles. Oh. And if you didn't have the article, you might not know what the cartoon was about. Yeah. Well, it's so like I most of my cartoons. Half the time people do. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. you know, when I see your cartoons, it makes me really want to, try to dig a little deeper and see what it is you're talking about. You know, the average American who's never been to the Philippines, you know, only knows what they read, you know, occasionally in the, in the papers or see on TV, if there's some big thing happening. One of the things that I first knew about the Philippines was when the Beatles went there and <laughs> uh, were, were like, you know, snubbed, they snubbed Marcos and had to fear yeah, for their yeah, lives, yeah. you know? <laughs> But then um, my, uh, I had a girlfriend who was in the Peace Corps in the Philippines. Yeah. And she, was, uh, she went there to basically teach people about aquaculture, how to, oh. you know, grow fish for 
food consumption. Oh, okay. She said, but she wound up teaching women how to breastfeed. Oh. You, know, you, you sort of had to do what needed when you got there. Oh, okay. She was trained for one thing, but then she shows people the other thing. Um, oh. Yeah. And at the it must time, have been out of left field for her, I guess. Yeah. And she wasn't a mom, but uh, it was something that she could figure out how to do. Okay. Um, it was funny. She, at the time, I, I was really into San Marco, San Miguel Dark mm-hmm. beer. And she said, Oh, over there, only women drink that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't okay. drink beer, okay, but I'll, I'll have to remember I'll, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned the Beatles, right? You're a drummer, right, for for yeah. various local bands and venues and stuff, um, which yeah. I find is pretty cool, right? Um, what, what, how has the drummer's life been like? Has it been like wine, women, and song? Or I mean, <laughs> or <laughs> has it been, you know, how, 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 you know, one, how did you become a drummer? And, um, you know, how has your musical career been? Okay. Um, well, I started off uh, when I was in high school. Um, and I started off, we had a ukulele in our house. So I, I picked that up. And then my grandfather uh, had a classical guitar that somehow wound up at our house. So it's close enough to the ukulele to where I could start playing it. You know, and I saw the Beatles on TV and it was like every other kid in America. Okay, I want to play guitar and be in a band. So I, um, I played guitar for probably 10 years or so uh, through high school. And uh, I played with a couple of people um, out, you know, I was, but I wasn't very good. You know, I was a rhythm guitarist and turns out it was the rhythm that really attracted me. So I switched over to drums uh-huh. and I've been playing drums for, you know, last 30 years or so. Um, I've worked with a lot of different people in a lot of different genres, um, everything from Irish music to uh, uh, jazz fusion, traditional jazz, um, reggae, rock and roll, alt country. I even played some hip hop. Uh, oh. I worked. I worked with a couple of people who have won Grammys, and oh, cool. I got to record one time in Nashville, which was uh, really. A lot of fun um you know when the pandemic hit everything shut down and there was no gigs for anybody and that was like okay i mean the guy that's been mowing my lo- my lawn is an incredible saxophone player and his band had to quit so he you know started a lawn a lawn care business oh. and um you know at the time I didn't have to worry too much about income because I had started my social security, but uh, I didn't, didn't do any gigs for a year or so. And then they started having shows outside where you could, you could be outside and the audience might be in the parking lot or something. And everyone was wearing masks and, you know, that's, that's how it worked. And right now, I mean, I'm in one band and we're, uh, we're playing out. Um, there's a, a place here in town that I play a lot, and they basically you have to have an immunization card to get to come in. And uh, you know things have loosened up a lot, but COVID cases are starting to rise again. So it's like it's not like we're past it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know drums, drums really, it's it's a passion. Uh, there's just it's so much fun and it's, it brings so much fun to people. Uh, I'm just, you know, until I can't carry all that crap around, I'm going to keep doing it. You know, everything's got wheels on it now. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah I'm yeah. curious. Um, I mean, who were, who were you a big uh, Gene Krupa fan, uh, Jess, or were you, were you more the Ringo Starr, Keith Moon was, type? Yeah, you know, I didn't start listening to those jazz drummers like Buddy Rich and Krupa and uh, Ed Shaughnessy till you know much later. I was the Beatles, you know, Ringo yeah. just really turned me on to that stuff. Um, I, you know, and since then, some of my favorite drummers are like incredible jazz drummers, you know, yeah. progressive jazz drummers, people like uh, Dave Weckl, um, Vinnie Kaliuta. 
even Stuart Copeland, you know, just yeah, yeah. great yeah, police. Great right. drummers. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I lo- you know, a lot of my career as a drummer has been people saying, oh, we need a sub. Can you come in and, and play this gig with us? And I say, okay, send me a set list uh, and I'll look these songs up and I'll try not to embarrass myself when I play this gig with you. Yeah. And um, so having to be really on my toes about, I might have to sit in on a song that I've never heard before. So it's as much of what I don't play as it is what I do play. Uh, and just keeping in mind that I'm not there to solo. I'm not there to have the focus on me. I'm there to serve the song. And if the song goes on and people don't even notice that I'm playing drums and I did my job correctly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is that part what? of the fun of it? You know, it's just, you know, being it on your toes. Yeah, it is. You know, it's like um, improvising uh, in some ways. You know, you get to a point where you're confident enough in what you do that you don't get scared going into a situation like that. You figure, oh, yeah, I'm a little nervous, but I know that once it gets going, I can handle it. I can I can do what needs to be done. The interesting thing, Angelo, a lot of people, a lot of cartoonists are musicians as well. Oh, okay. It's uh, yeah, I- Notice that you know, uh, you know Jeff Caturba out in uh, Nebraska. He's got a, a band. They played in New York City. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, have you guys jammed? Uh, I mean, or have you guys you know well, with other cartoonists? No. Uh, no, but I imagine if uh, if some people brought instruments to one of the conventions, there might be some jamming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Too bad you can't bring your drums to uh, to. Uh, uh, where is it again? Where is it? They're, they're doing it Columbus. this year. Yeah, Columbus and stuff. That would be cool. Do you remember? You remember Dwayne Powell? I don't remember. I, I met a few. You know, in the conventions, I would meet a cartoonist yeah. and stuff, and then I would go and, I would, and they would tell me, "Oh, do you like my work?" And I'd say yes, and then I'd go to the hotel and look up their work. <laughs> Dwayne, Dwayne um, he was the cartoonist in Raleigh for. Uh, oh, okay. And he. I don't think he ever won a Pulitzer, but he should have. He was a, a really great cartoonist and a, a really cool guy. So I got to meet him and he's a guitar player and singer. And so um, one day, uh, probably about five years ago now, he um, invited me down to Raleigh and I said, well, I'll bring my drums. And then uh, he said, yeah, do that because I, I need some drums on a recording that I'm working on with oh, wow. Jim, Jim Keefe who's a cartoonist out in Colorado. Uh They collaborate over the uh, internet. So Uh um, I went down and stayed with uh, Dwayne and his wife, Jan, for a weekend and um, recorded some drums on one of his songs. And uh, it was was fantastic. It was fun. Oh, cool, cool. You know, uh, there's a note in my computer saying we have four minutes left. Okay. So let me give let me just give you a, a last question and um, okay. you know you, so you, being a cartoonist that you have, um, how, how do you see the political cartooning profession evolving and stuff? And um, so what do you and what do you see as the future of American editorial cartooning? Well, I think that it's always going to we're always going to be here. Uh, okay. You know this kind of commentary. You know, as, a, as Americans' attention spans get shorter and shorter and shorter, you see on TV 10-second uh, commercials now. Um, I think that we'll always be around. We have to transition from print to uh, digital, and we have to figure out how to monetize it. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's always going to be a place for editorial cartooning. Okay. And uh, I hope that... Uh, you and I get to do this for as long as we want to. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> yeah, I used to think that um, we would transition to like graphic novels, but uh, several people pointed to me to the flaws 
in that theory. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, you're, you're right and stuff. I, I was just thinking that because I noticed that there's several graphic novels that are political and they seem to um, have big sales. So, and, yeah. and since the problem of cartoonists is financial and stuff, but, um, you know, one, I, graphic novels take a lot of work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you have to draw characters that look the same from panel to panel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I think you're more right and stuff because, um, yeah. And I begin to realize, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm wrong <laughs> and stuff, but yeah, I, I think you're right about that. And so do, do you have any last words or anything or. I'm just, it's been great talking with you and I'm really excited that uh, you're doing this podcast series. I, I look forward to seeing other cartoonists that you're talking with so I can kind of get a sense of who they are and what they're doing. And, I really okay. hope that we both get to go to Columbus in October. Um, it would be great to meet you in person and also to, you know, just see the giants of our field right there. Yeah.